members of the presidency, authorities, distinguished guests, dear friends. It, it's a great challenge to express my gratitude to the BBVA Foundation and to all of you for, for sharing in this very special occasion. I, I want to take just a few minutes of your time to talk about how lucky my life in science has been. And I'll try to give you some food for thought about environmental challenges and explain why I'm still optimistic about how we can solve them together. The best part of my adventure in science actually started in Antarctica. The discovery of the Antarctic ozone hole almost 30 years ago sent a shockwave around the world. And I worked on a, a theoretical explanation for what was happening, uh, together with wonderful colleagues, one of whom is here tonight. I had the great honor of, of leading the U.S. National Ozone Expedition to Antarctica in 1986, and there we made some of the first chemical measurements confirming human-made chlorofluorocarbons as the cause of that remarkable ozone hole. I um, then began to work on the fascinating issue of how the ozone hole is actually affecting the surface climate in and around Antarctica. That's a subject that I'm still pursuing today. To explore the polar regions, to do field work in science, and to experience the, the, the joy of uh, working on science out in nature has really been uh, a tremendous uh, thrill in my life and an honor in my work. I've uh, been tremendously lucky not only in what I've been able to do and where I've been able to do it, but also the people with whom I've, I've worked. And uh, I'm deeply grateful for the luck that I've had on, in, in, in finding those wonderful colleagues and being able to work with them. The ozone hole was really a different kind of environmental problem. It wasn't like typical air pollution and water pollution issues that are very important, but that everyone can see and hear, even in some cases, and smell, taste in your own backyard. The ozone layer involved a part of the world that uh, was very far away, a layer that you couldn't see, at the bottom of the world where nobody lived, and yet people all around the world became interested in ozone. I find that people uh, are often wonderfully curious about the environment. They can be turned on to science uh, just because they can generally see the same things in it that we all see as scientists, elegant truths. And I like to say that science is literally the light of the world. The world got curious and took the time to understand the elegant truths about ozone depletion, and governments ultimately decided to act as a result, really, of uh, the public interest. Today, chlorofluorocarbons are not produced anymore anywhere in the world, and uh, by the middle of this century, we should certainly see the ozone hole heal. It'll begin to heal in the next few decades. But now we're facing a much greater and more difficult challenge in chemical risk management, and that, of course, is climate change due mainly to increases in carbon dioxide. Climate change has been called the mother of all environmental issues, and for very good reasons. Energy use is fundamental to our comfort, to the economics of every society, and much of today's uh, energy systems rely on burning fossil fuel and therefore releasing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. The president talked about ethics in his remarks, and I, I just want to mention briefly one of the things that has troubled me a great deal in the last few years, and it's the fact that the countries that produce very, very little carbon dioxide, the poor countries of the world, are actually the ones who are the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And I think that's an issue that we all need to think about and talk about a lot more, because at the moment, for example, each typical uh, American produces about 200 times more carbon dioxide per person per year than the typical Ethiopian. And even in Europe, you produce about 100 times more than the typical Ethiopian. So as people in the developing world develop, if they use carbon as we use carbon to fuel that development, there's no question that the world will become very hot indeed by the end of, of this century. That's really not an issue that even the, uh, the skeptics would debate. They may think that it will take longer, but they'll, I think, agree that when you have a world in which the benefits of fossil fuel burning are being enjoyed by only a billion people, and six billion are ready to develop, wish to develop, need to develop, uh, it poses a, a huge ethical challenge. So I, I think the, the issue that faces us is to really look at the problem and become interested in it, to talk about it. 
Just as in the case of ozone, people are becoming curious and inventive about this problem. They can be turned on to understanding the science and the search for solutions. I think people uh, have really begun to look at the problem much more deeply than they have before, and that is what encouraged me, encourages me today. The train of understanding has definitely left the station. That's the first step in solving the problem. It's not an easy problem. Investment in research and development seems to me to be the way forward. I think we have an ethical and moral responsibility to do that. And uh, I, I, I really uh, uh, feel that, indeed, we will get there as long as we remem remember those considerations. So finally, in closing, I would just like to thank the Foundation again, to thank my friends and colleagues who've taken the time and trouble to, to come here and celebrate with us. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention here tonight. Thank you.